Where would they get the water from? What would happen if we were to stop sending them oil? What would happen if we stop stop sending them gas? All of us have to use oil. Yeah, you go home tonight, your mom she cooks. Yeah, she cooks in oil, isn't it? Everybody uses gas. You use gas to you know keep your house warm. You use gas for your cooker. You know these are things that we all need and we all use. What happens if you don't have a supply of this gas anymore? You know, imagine British Gas come along and they say, you know, you, Mr. Ahmed, you haven't paid your bill. We're going to switch off your gas. You're going to be sitting there freezing in your house because you've got no gas to warm up your house and you've got no gas to cook your food, isn't it? You're not going to have your fried chips and eggs or whatever you have. And this is a reality. We're supplying the country who's killing us and killing Muslims. We're supplying them gas and we're supplying them oil. And, you, and we're saying to them, you can go and do whatever you want. Not a problem. Now use the oil, put the oil in your tanks, put the petrol in your tanks, and then use your tanks to go and bulldoze Muslims and go kill Muslims. What else do we find? You know, let's look at this uh, Gaza war. You know, I mentioned before how, you know, Gaza, it's, it's basically on the border with, Israel, uh, with Egypt, yeah? And we have tunnels that go underneath Gaza into Egypt. And you would think, you know, any Muslim country would help their Muslim brothers, isn't it? Because we believe in this ayah in the Quran, where Allah says in the translation of the meaning, yeah? All of you hold fast to the rope of Allah. So we're all brothers, isn't it? We all, we all help each other, we all cooperate with each other. So what do you think Israel, do, uh, Egypt done when the Gaza war was taking place? Did they open these tunnels and allow, allow these women and these children to escape from their bombings and, and to come into Egypt to seek safety and security? No, what happens? They actually shut it. Yeah, so you had these tunnels which Muslims could escape from and go into Egypt, but they actually shut these tunnels. And not only did they shut the tunnels, they actually got, they rolled out you know, he's now passed away, but they rolled out one of the scholars for dollars, one of these government scholars, put him in front of the media, and he, and he basically said, and this guy is Sheikh Tantawi, and he says that it's one of Egypt, Egypt's legitimate rights to place a barrier that prevents harm from a tunnel which are used to smuggle drugs and, and, uh, and contraband. So he's basically saying that because this tunnel is used to smuggle, you know, drugs and other things which is bad, that's why we're going to shut it. Yeah, at a time when a land's being pounded by bombs and missiles, that women and children are, are, are living uh, under this constant fear. Rather than allowing these women and children through your tunnels and to give them sanctuary and security in your lands, you're doing what? You're blocking the tunnels because you're worried about cigarettes that are going to come through your borders without paying tax. Yeah, and these are your government scholars coming out with stuff like this. And another statement, you know, uh, made by the same person, he said that those who are opposed to the building of this wall are violating the commands of Islamic law. Yeah, this was a statement made by the Sheikh Tantawi on the first of January. Yeah, so he's basically saying those people who 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 oppose the Egyptians building this wall to stop Palestinians from coming over, yeah, into Egypt, they're basically violating Islamic law. You know what happened on the second of January? Second of January is the day when the Israeli jets started to fire uh, fire into into Gaza. So it's like almost, you're, you're, you're in a house, yeah, and this house is on fire. And then you have a brother standing by the door. And then rather than your brother opening the door and your brother asking you to come out and trying to encourage you to come out of your house, the brother shuts the door in your face and watches you burn while you're in this house. And then you have a scholar for dollar, one of these government scholars, basically saying that, you know, you're violating Islamic law if you, if you disagree with us building this wall. Yeah, this is the treachery of our governments. <clears throat> what else do we find? Not only that, not only do they not supply, uh, not, so, uh, not allow uh, uh, people from Palestine to come through the tunnels, it was, uh, it was exposed that, you know, these, you know, soldiers have food rations, yeah? You know, if you're a soldier, you get little packets of food that you eat. I don't know if you've ever seen Bear Grylls, yeah? You normally open these little tins, and it's got these little packets which the soldiers eat when they're out, on the, out in, the, in the war. It was actually discovered and it was exposed that, you know where this food that the soldiers are eating coming from? Guess where it's made? It's actually made by an Egyptian company. It's made by an Egyptian company, it's exported to Israel and the Israelis then give to their soldiers to eat. So while these soldiers were occupying Gaza and fighting and killing Muslims, when it comes to their dinner time, they were eating actually, probably more likely, halal Egyptian food that was made by some, Egyptian, uh, by some company in Egypt. And you think, that, you know, you're just sitting there and you're thinking, and you, it's amazing to think. Here is a country that's at war with Muslims, yeah, that has declared a war with Allah and His Messenger, and you have a Muslim country 
that rather than fighting these people, you actually have a Muslim country that's actually supplying them food for their soldiers to eat. You know, it just beggars belief how this happens. So, you know, to sum up this talk, you know, what are the main points we want to talk about? You know, alhamdulillah, our donations to, Pal to the people of Palestine helps, but it's not the solution. Yeah? The passionate statements that everybody makes and the passionate talks that everybody gives about the issue of, of, uh, of Palestine helps, but it's not the solution. You know, sending stones and hijabs like the Saudi Arabian government done once in the 90s, you know, after women had their hijabs pulled off in Palestine and the uh, young kids that were throwing stones, what did the Saudi government do? It thought it would be helpful if we send them a truckload of stones so they can throw at the Israelis even more. These stones and these hijabs are not going to help. This collection and this food that we collect for the Palestinians, alhamdulillah, it will help for the, for the time being, for the short time. But it's not going to solve the problem in Palestine. Yeah? Expelling ambassadors for the countries is not going to solve the problem. Wherever, you know, you always find that all of a sudden, you know, the war takes place or Israelis do something against the Palestinians. The first thing that, that our governments do, they come out and then they do what? We expel the Israeli ambassador from our country like they think it's a, such a major thing. And more than this, you know these crocodile tears and these passionate statements that our rulers make during this issue. You know, if you remember, if you watch press TV and you see people like Mahmoud Abadinejad, yeah? He would basically come out and he would just basically talk about the Jews and what they're doing and he would always going to talk about how we're going to sort them out and we're going to deal with them. What does he actually do? What does he actually do? It's like you get a bully, he just comes along and he gives you all the talk, but when it, when it actually comes to the action, what does he do? He does nothing. And you find all of our governments, they all come out and gave passionate speeches about the people of Palestine and how they're going to liberate the Palestinians and how they're going to defend the honourable people of Palestine. And what do they do? <coughs> they sit there and they do nothing. And you actually think, you know, looking back as a solution for this issue of Palestine, we have the ability. Yeah, and I was just doing a, a quick... A quick search on the internet, yeah? If you look at the armies that surround this area of Palestine, you know, we think sometimes Israel, the army is so strong, we can't do nothing. Egypt has 450,000 active personnel, active people in the armies, yeah? And they have the same number of warplanes that the Israeli have. Yeah, 450,000 personnel. Turkey has over a million active people in the army. Yeah, so that's already one and a half million people in the armies, if we combine these forces. Syria has 300,000. Saudi Arabia has 200,000 uh, active personnel in the armies. And more than that, they have 150 F-15 fighter planes. Yeah? So if you just do a quick sum, we have over a combination of over 200, uh, sorry, 2 million uh, active people in the armies surrounding Israel. Just the countries actually surround Israel. Over 2 million soldiers. And you would think, what would happen if these 2 million soldiers come together and come to defend the Muslims of Palestine? Would we not be able to solve the issue of Palestine? Imagine you had these two, two million soldiers, plus you cut off the supply of gas, and you cut off the supply of electricity. You stop sending the soldiers their food in their little bags. Yeah, and we cut off the supply of water. What would they be able to do? They wouldn't be able to do nothing. You know, in fact, when I was doing some research about these uh, Saudi F-15s, there's a place in Saudi Arabia called uh, Tabuk. Yeah? And it's in the, you know, if, re, if Makkah's hair, Tabuk's like round hair, like in the, the western part of the country. It's only 15 minutes by airplane into Gaza. And that's one of the air bases where they store these F-15s. 15 minutes. Yeah, 15 minutes from Gaza where they store these airplanes. But what do you think the government, what do you think the, these airplanes were doing when the, when the Israelis were sending their planes to kill Muslims? You know, the Saudi Arabian army were probably polishing their polishing their missiles and polishing their, their windscreens of these, ta of these planes. And we have the king, the custodian of two holy mosques. You know, someone he should remind him that he's forgot the third holy mosque. You now, according to the hadith. You know, there aren't only two holy mosques, there's actually three holy mosques in Islam. But obviously the king of Saudi Arabia is not too interested in those, so he only calls them the custodian of the two holy mosques. So the reality is, is that we as Muslims, our rulers have the ability to solve the problems of Palestine. The problem of Palestine is not going to be fixed by the, by the British, because they're the people who created it in the first place. And the problems of Palestine is going to be fixed by Obama, because we've seen what Obama's been doing, and the new declarations he's been signing. 